All right, Eric. We're officially doing this. It's been a long time in the works. Made it to Kauai. The number one question we get out there, can you help define what foundation training is for people watching that do know, don't know? Like, How do you define what it is these days? So what foundation training started out as was a very basic posterior chain recruitment exercise. There was a handful of poses that challenged the lower back, challenged the hamstrings, and supported the, the posture. What it's become over 12 years now, 13 years now, is this vitality program that both protects the spine, improves the function of the hips, improves the function of the feet, improves the function of the lungs, and the, the muscles around the lungs, improves your posture, decreases stress. There's just this self-improvement tool that has kind of been born out of what started as a posterior chain integration protocol. And now foundation training is a legitimate chronic pain management process that you start learning and you learn how to breathe better, you learn how to stand better, you learn how to control your posture better. And it really takes you a lot further than I ever anticipated it would. And so a lot of people don't realize that you are a guy that created this through an injury. And so I wanna, I wanna actually touch on your injury and what life was like before the injury, before you were, were finding yourself with back pain. When I think I knew you at the early days. Yeah, I was, I was strong. You know, I was, I've was. i always been a pretty strong guy and I was always really into personal training, working out at the gym. I wanted to be a chiropractor. I wanted to just like, I wanted to understand the body really, really well. I wanted to be able to help people in the ways that I needed help, which were, I always had kind of like a weak back. My, my back kind of started going out a little bit when I was, probably around when I met you, but I didn't, it wasn't like something I complained about. It was just like, it's kind of tight. I, never, I didn't understand it. Um, the first herniation I felt was like into my 1920s around there. And it was like, it's, you know, anybody that's experienced it, it's really sharp. Um, I would say that up to that point, I was a modest athlete. I swam, I played water polo, I played ice hockey a long time, I skated, I rollerbladed, I, I biked, I, I just did a lot. I, mean, I played baseball as a young kid, I just kind of did whatever. But I never heavily excelled at any sport. And I always kind of had this boundary, it felt like. Like I just couldn't quite get good enough to be really good. I could get okay. I could be competitive, but never really good. And if I would try to push the boundaries in anything, I would hurt myself, it seemed. Mm. So it was like, that was, that was it. I was big, I was strong, but even if I like pushed too hard at the gym, I would get really sore. Not pretty sore, get really sore. So I was like, I was sensitive in a weird way. My body was sensitive, that's the best way I could put it. If I pushed too hard from a very young age, I knew that I had to back off. And I you mean, in a lot of ways, like, you remember me in college, I didn't go out drinking and partying. I didn't go out and stay up all night. Like I wasn't that guy. I was pretty, I kind of stayed kind of mellow most of the time, except I'd wakeboard and train and I would do those things. Yeah, like, I, I, can, I can pretty much attest to that. That was always, yeah. we try to drag Eric out. No, nah, I'm good, I'm gonna study, but we would go wakeboarding consistently. Yeah. We'd go mountain biking. Yeah. We'd go to the gym and strength training. You bought my mountain bike. I did. I, did. <laughs> I was so bummed when it got stolen. My, I thought it was a good idea to leave it in the back of my truck. Yeah. But we, yeah, we were living very, very active lifestyles. That's why when we reconnected later to learn, I, I, to learn that you had had this back history that mm -hmm. I never knew about. That's why I was, I wanted to really touch on when that came to be a real thing. Yeah. And, and for those out there that have gone through it, Mentally, what was that like for you as that young guy of living that lifestyle and then having this abrupt moment? So, when I so I, I met you when I was about twenty, and I left school when I was twenty three mm -hmm. to go to chiropractic school. And in that three years, I had probably a couple episodes, and it, it got a little worse over that period. And when I went to chiropractic school, it started to get a lot worse. That was the precipice of like I kind of I went over a ledge mm. where pain became unmanageable when it would go out it went from stiff and tight and kind of painful to unmanageable pain uh, and I, I attribute that to like sitting in class all day for eight to nine in college I sat in class for an hour or two at a time but we were active I was playing all the time the whole time I was in Orlando at UCF it was like the vast majority of my time was focused around swimming working out playing water polo mountain biking, wakeboarding. 
that and then I went to classes even and I, I was pre-med I was like trying to you know but it, it's it's easy in college at that at that time right then you go to grad school and you're in class all day every day seven in the morning until about four o'clock in the afternoon and then you have to study everything you just learned for several hours every single day if you, and if you get behind you get so far behind that you either fail out or you you just don't sleep for mm. many many days and it's, it's too much it's way too intense for both staying super healthy and in the current of grad school right so that's when I that's when I started slipping my health started slipping my mental health started slipping my sleep started slipping my back really slipped and it was weak as I got exhausted more and more and I sat more and more and I got adjusted more and more by young people that didn't know how to adjust as I kind of said earlier like it broke me down and it, my back was not strong enough plain and simple my posterior chain my hips my lower back did not have the complex movement patterns they needed to stop that from happening and, and breaking me down. And over the years, that's been the remedy, that's foundation training, but up to that point, I was, I w I was fascinated by anatomy. I, I was a, by the time I knew you in college, I was already certified as a personal trainer. I just wasn't working as one. I worked in a chiropractic clinic as a rehab therapist and occasionally at the World Gym as like an in-house <laughs> personal nice. trainer, you know? Yeah. And, and a bouncer. That was the other gig was I worked as a bouncer that when I was my freshman year. So I was just kind of this big kid. I was a big, heavy, strong kid. I thought I was kind of invincible, but I also had this inkling in the back of my head knowing that I was sensitive mm. in many different ways. And knowing that when I felt the tax of energy debt, I felt it hard. So... I think that was kind of like, honestly, I think that might be why I decided to go to chiropractic school was I knew I wasn't going to make it through a residency program or I wasn't going to be an emergency room doctor. I, didn't, I couldn't stay up all night. I knew that I wanted to help people, but I also wanted to have a lot of freedom around my life to do all the things I love to do. And then when the injury got really bad, I got really, really angry at chiropractic and at the decisions that I had made and the debt that I had accrued and the volume of my life at that stage that I had committed to this thing that I also felt had broken me down pretty bad. Uh, so that was a really interesting time, 25, 26, 27, 28. And you think about it, it's like you combine the precipice, the, the pinnacle of the injury with the pinnacle of my stress, with the pinnacle of being a chiropractor, but being in so much pain that I couldn't practice on people. And then I failed my boards and it was just this, it was just too many, it was this perfect storm of too much stress. And I was just like, I just felt like I made a lot of wrong decisions by the time I was 27, 28 years old. And the, the pain of that was very physical. Yeah. Um, and that being said, then everything shifted. When I identified why the pain was there, weakness, lack of discipline, lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, relying on other people to fix this instead of relying on myself. It was like I could break down a, the slights of character that I found in myself mm -hmm. that allowed me to get to this point. And I could use that idea of, I really like who I am. I really care about who I am. And I don't want this to be the end of that guy's life journey. I don't want to then go get surgery and be fixed in this miserable moment of my life that is going to be long and I've been inspired and had a good time my whole life so why would I let this little window this little one or two percentage amount of my whole life why would I get stuck here that's how I looked at fusion surgery when they told me to get it yeah what, did, what was yeah. the diagnosis that they I, I, just have, I have high amounts of degenerative joint disease and degenerative disc disease at multiple levels of my lumbar spine. It's just arthritic changes. I let it collapse too early and I put weight on top of it too poorly. And then I opened up my hips all day every day in what's called an egg beater mm -hmm. uh, tread for water polo. And then I got adjusted into hypermobility by a bunch of students that didn't know what the hell they were doing just like I did and it eventually became good doctors, good chiropractors. Some of them, some of them still suck. Um, but it was just this, 
if, when I look back on it, I'm like, if I could have made a soup of instability, this is the physical soup of instability. Well, what are the doctors, when you went to the, when they did the MRIs and they look at this injury? Oh, DJD. Yeah. Degenerative, the, the diagnosis is a very, it's the most common diagnosis. It's degenerative joint disease. And what was the options they gave you? Uh, 360 degree fusion surgery at L4, L5, L5, S1. Um, I've had numerous neurosurgeon and, and, and back surgeon patients over the years that I've helped, and they've seen my MRIs, and they all, yeah, I would send this yeah. guy to surgery in a heartbeat. Well, this is what I really want to hit on, is because uh, we've had the other docs come through the certification yeah. that have been, I was in chronic pain treating people with back oh, pain, and this has allowed me to start adjusting again and treating patients and not feeling like I've got a, the next 30 years of the doctor in pain. Mm -hmm. But for you... I, what is that, you, you know, you said you were angry, you said that, you know, I, I needing to learn, even though you just learned so much in college, mm -hmm. but where does that put you when you're being delivered that, mm -hmm. and you're supposed to be the guy that's going out there to lead the charge mm -hmm. of wellness? Like, mentally, what does that do to you? I, I'm, it's very frustrating. It's like deeply life-changing frustrating, to the point that you'll literally, you'll go out on a limb. You'll do anything you can to not get stuck there. And for me, the only way to not get stuck there was to continuously feel better. And it was weird because that's when opportunities started to happen. When I, when I, for, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't sitting in my room, okay, am I going to have this surgery? Am I not, what am I going to do and who am I going to become? I can see that, but that's not the way it worked. You know, at that, it might, that be, might work. That's what you see in a movie. It might work that way now. <laughs> now. It might work that way. Back then, I was like, shit, I'm not getting surgery. No. Fuck. Are you kidding? I'm not. I, I, no, I told my girlfriend at the time. Absolutely not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix this. I'm going to fix this. That was seem like a little, it didn't feel a little arrogant at the time? Of course it was, but I was a doctor. I was a 27-year-old guy about to become a doctor. <laughs> yeah, you're supposed like, to be. I was, I'm an arrogant guy sometimes, and but never, so, I'm never, ever, ever, I'm not confident. I'm not an I was saying, but you, it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, let me rephrase that. It wasn't area. You confidently believed you could. So here's what I had on my side. So let's say, all right, I'm 27 years old. I've been the guy you met my whole life. I've drawn a lot of people to me for whatever reason my whole life that were physical. I've always wanted to play. Even though I've never been the best athlete, I've always had the most fun. I've always been had the biggest smile on my face while we're doing whatever we're doing. And I love watching other people do it just as much as I like doing it. And I've always been friends with action sports athletes and firefighters my whole life. And that was just who I was. So I always had this drive. And in chiropractic school, I kind of got beat down. Mm. Like, I was never good at school. I failed my MCATs the first time I took my MCATs for medical school. I failed my MCATs the second time I took my MCATs for medical school. I went to chiropractic school because med school seemed too hard. Chiropractic school was just as fucking hard. Yeah. It was so hard. It was so hard. It was, I'm not a good student. I never have been, but I'm really good at anatomy, and I'm really good at understanding something, simplifying it so that I can finally get it, and then sharing that information with somebody and helping them get it. And that became accidentally my life was, what's wrong with me? How can I fix it? Hmm, it's gonna take a lot of effort. Might as well start now. Mm -hmm. Oh wow, that's starting to feel a lot better. Hey, is your back hurting? You should try this. Yeah, this is, I, yeah I'm a chiropractor, kind of. Eventually I'll be a chiropractor. No, but try this though. Like, Feel what this does because everybody's back hurts. And I just started to get excited about what I was feeling in my own body. And my everything I was doing at that moment was extension based and squeezing my legs. Extension at the spine, squeezing my legs. Extension at the spine, squeezing my legs. Literally protecting the bottom and top of the joint that felt weak in my body. The, my lowest edges of the spine were very weak and very unstable and extraordinarily sensitive. But what, what brought that initial because, I mean, I go into a doc, they give me that diagnosis, I'm in a lot of pain, I, my mind's like... I had a lot shit, of knowledge. What, so you had the knowledge. Yeah. But, I mean, was there, what was the aha moment of, oh, this combination? Or was it, it like, wasn't you just the knew it needed yeah. to... The first, so the combo, the first, the first relief that I ever felt, like, where I could directly correlate, I'm in pain, I did this, I'm out of... Well, there it is again, there it is, holy shit. 
I was in a yoga class at Yoga Works on Main Street in Huntington Beach. This was 2007. My back was out. I was trying everything I could. I went into a chair pose that hurt like hell, and I lifted my arms as high as I could until it extended my spine, and I could feel the off switch of pain. And then I flexed my spine, huh, extended, huh. And I did that a few times, and then I held that. Everything I could do, like literally, imagine like, I'm like, or you know, I'm, so normally that, I'm standing up like that, like I'm in pain, just so anybody watching, I can, that, I'm not in pain. But imagine I'm, I'm like hurting, you know, I'm like hurting, and all of a sudden, I'm like, it doesn't hurt. Oh my God. Like literally, what I'm, like this is real. This if is, I've been through it, no. Like I was silent. And I was just like, shit. And I, like, that's, I can, my head exploded. When I felt extension take over my symptoms, like, like somebody that I loved just hugging me. Yeah. Be, and you gotta understand, like, $200,000 in debt, 27 years old, my entire life devoted to everything that I was learning at this stage because for some reason I was good at it. I don't, I still don't know what brought me to be good at it other than my own sensitivity and pains but I was good at it and I was starting to get some accolade it was a really weird transitional period while I was finding out how much was wrong with me I was being invited into big opportunities that had the potential to be life-changing yeah I was starting to travel for sports medicine I was being invited to be the doctor on an Olympic team for the 2008 Beijing games like and I was scared and I was nervous and so many things were happening but the one anchor to this day was I could extend my spine and feel better. I could ground myself through physical sensation, mm. no matter what was happening up here. So, I'm in this yoga class, which I went back to a number of times for like two weeks. I just got myself better in there mm -hmm. the first time. I'm in this class, I'm feeling this extension release. I'm walking back, I'm either walking back or riding my bike back. But we lived about a mile and a half from there. It was me and Dustin living together during chiropractic school. I'm gonna get this right. I'm riding, I think I'm riding back. And I lived with Brian Jacoby, another chiropractor, and Dustin Dirickey, who's now Dustin's Dustin. foundation training. And I think I came back and told Dustin, I think, I was like, I think I just fixed my back. Like, I, I, I was so confident. I'm like, I just fixed my back. I fixed it. I might have been wrong. It took years. But that first initial extension pose literally went against everything I had ever heard in chiropractic school. Yeah. Everything we were taught in rehab, every dead bug exercise, every quadruped exercise, every deep neck flexor, deep abdominal tension, all the literature, everything. And that changed, that, that was it. I was, like, I was, I don't know, I don't know if this is maybe the arrogant moment, but I was like, they're fucking wrong. <laughs> like, God, they're wrong. And now here we are, and I'm yeah. like, and I was kind of right. Like, they were wrong. Well, it's, I, and I, and I'm, because I don't want to go back on what I said arrogant. It, it's more of a, a, what I think is, is powerful, like, is there's a self belief in all of yeah, it. Yeah, the self belief. You know? and, and even getting that, and to go through that, I mean, that. let's face it, like that's when big things start to come about, like foundation training. And there's got to be these defining moments where somebody goes through, believes strongly enough in what they're doing to come out the other side with something. Yeah. And, you know, to hear all that and going now, you're, you're in this point with your back. You're having these aha moments that are real. You're starting to work with Olympic athletes. Mm -hmm. And as you said, they were really your first test subjects. I was still, I mean, I know how that happened. Can you give that context? Because that, that yeah. I, I, I got where I want to go. What was the, set, the situation with, with the uh, Olympic athletes? Can you paint a quick picture for everybody? Okay, so I'm 27. Uh, my initial, my earliest, I, I wouldn't necessarily call him my mentor, but he was a guy, a, a really well-known doctor that I happened to have a relationship with because my dad's best friend, Dr. Ron Welikoff, was really close friends with this guy, Dr. Tom Hyde. And when I met Tom, I was in college, and I had these anatomy flashcards, these Frank Netter anatomy flashcards, and I thought I knew so much. And I was like a teacher assistant in anatomy and this Such and that. Such a good student. Oh my gosh, yeah. And I was a terrible student, but I was a good studier. Like I wanted to, I wanted to know anatomy really, really, really bad. I really, want, like I wanted to understand anatomy better than anything. 
and I was kind of showing off a little bit to Tom Hyde, who is at that stage. So I'm like 19, 20 years old, 20, maybe 21, 22 at this stage. Tom is a world-renowned, internationally recognized, published sports medicine doctor. Mm. One of the best in the world. He's one of the initial practitioners and partners in the Graston technique. He's one of the best educators on soft tissue technique in the world. And he, we get along really well. And he sees something in me, and he tells me he sees something in me. And he, pers- he kind of persuades me, like, you should really think about sports medicine and the side of it, and maybe even traveling to some of these events with me. And he invited me to go to the Central American Games in Cartagena. Uh, and I went with a team of sports medicine doctors. This was my second year of chiropractic school. And I went for the Central American Games, and I, and I did really well, and I helped some people. Some emergency situations even happened to mm. stem up, and sometimes those really test people, and I, ha- I did well. A couple broken fingers, not, not major emergent, life-changing, but like, can you get a guy back in the game or no, and can they perform when you get them mm. back in? And I've had an extraordinary success rate of getting people back into whatever they're playing, sometimes very quickly and very successfully. And that started in Cartagena. That started at the Central American Games with Dr. Greg Dore and Dr. Tom Hyde, who went on to develop a protocol called the FACTOR program, F-A-K-T-R, which is a very, very higher echelon, high level sports medicine soft tissue protocol. It's one of the best in the world. Long story short, Tom says, hey, I've got it. I moved out to LA to finish chiropractic school. I didn't like the Midwest, so I moved to LA. They had a much more much bigger sports medicine program, mm. much, much better overall. And Tom says, you know, I got, the, you play water polo. Do you know who Terry Schroeder is? Like, yeah, of course. I know who Terry Schroeder is. I mean, like, Terry Schroeder, the most decorated U.S. Olympian of all time um, at that stage and the captain of the U.S. water polo team for many years and a member of the largest chiropractic family in the world, 66, now probably 70-something of his family members direct are chiropractors. His, his great-grandfather was one of the founding members of chiropractic. So Terry Schroeder is like, whoa. You know, he lives pretty close to you. He was just named the assistant coach. No, I'm sorry, he was the assistant coach for the U.S. water polo team. You know, he was just named the head coach. He's bringing all the guys down for tryouts to Los Alamitos. I was in Huntington Beach. Los Alamitos is 20, 30 minutes away. He's like, you should, maybe I could organize you to go meet him. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I'm, I'm like, I'm just, I'm just moved to California. My back wasn't so bad that it was affecting my life yet. It was just tight and tender, and okay. I was very amped by being in California. Uh, and I was working out, and I was in class. I wasn't quite in clinic yet. Um, I was about, because I got backed up for transferring like six months, so I was about to start my clinical rounds, and I'm, I'm just going to go meet Terry Schroeder. And that worked out really well. I met him. I met the athletes. This was a year, year and a half before anything happened with the okay. polo team. So this is my first introduction to Terry Schroeder. And we just got along well. I was really impressed with, with him. This guy is a physical specimen if yeah. I've ever seen one. He's literally the statue that they, the, the LA Coliseum has an Olympic statue in front of it. And he's the model for that oh, nice. statue. There's this whole crazy Sports Illustrated article about him and... Big guy. He's the phys- Basically, he was in the 80s the depiction of strength for okay. the Olympics. Gotcha. Um, and so, t- anyways, Terry and I get along well. We, we meet. He, he invites me to be an intern in his office and just to come check out what he does. But I'm in school in Huntington Beach, and his office is in Thousand Oaks. Guess you're driving. It's two, two, two and a half, three hours each way in traffic, usually. How many days a week were you doing it? Five. Woo! I'm okay. committed. At yeah. this stage, I recognize, this is Terry Schroeder. Yeah. Who am I? This guy invited me to come work in his extremely successful practice. I'm going, but I'm living up there. Yeah. So I ended up basically shifting my last couple, my last year and a half of school. I had the house with Dustin, but I ended up, I was renting a room there, and I ended up, we got another roommate in there, and I moved up to... Right in between in Brentwood. Yeah. So I was an hour from there and an hour from Huntington, and I could still go to school and go to the internship. And it was just. So you're nuts. interning with them. Yeah. And it's called a preceptorship. Preceptorship. Yeah. And sorting out your back, interning with him. And talk to me about though, how it came to be actually testing this, getting, getting the green light to test yeah, totally foundation training on yeah. Olympic athletes. So that, it takes this year. 
it takes me so the water polo thing was never on the table yeah it was i never knew it was on the table i never knew it was something he was considered i was an intern in his office mm -hmm. treating his patients every now and then an athlete would come in every now and then a fan because of where he lived a, a person would come in that was yeah. full of notoriety and he started after about three four months he started really he almost was like hey i think you should go have eric take you through some stretching exercises Okay. Hey, I think, why don't you, you know what, you've got a frozen shoulder, why don't you have Eric, Eric does some really interesting body movements. Have him check out, have him try that. That's where foundation training subtly started foundation training. It wasn't called anything. Right. It was proximal hamstring recruitment, squaring of the hips, and expansion of the torso from the multifidus muscles. That's okay. in my head what it was at that stage. And I did it a lot in squeezing the adductors, yeah. always squeezing the adductors. Um, and he let me play with some of the patients and they started getting better and I was a pretty good adjuster so I would couple this strengthening work with the adjustments and mm. it was like, oh, oh, this is pretty interesting. And Terry's like, you're doing really well, man. Um, now I'm in clinic. So now I'm going to Whittier school clinic twice a week. Going to Terry's clinic three or four times a week. I can't, probably three times a week realistically. Mm -hmm. There's only five days that you can actually be doing that. So I'm thinking two days a week at Whittier, three days a week at Terry's clinic. Then he brings me to dinner at his house and his wife, Lori, cooks us this night. I, now, you got to understand, man, I'm fucking nobody. I've never had this kind of treatment. I've never had anything like this. I'm in school. I, I, and she cooks us this amazing dinner. They, like, sit me down. And he's like, what do you think about being a coach on the water polo team with me? I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, you know a lot about training. Every one of my guys is injured. We suck right now. They were number nine in the world. They were like okay. the laughing stock of water polo. It was not a good situation for the wow. team he came in on. And he was the first American coach of the American team in like 50 years. Okay. There was all these Serbian coaches and Czechoslovakian coaches and Hungarian coaches. And now they were really trying with like the American golden boy. So he's like, I want this to go well. Come in and be the chiropractor and strength coach. Don't change anything. <laughs> Can't promise that. One of the guys, Ryan Bailey, was one of the athletes, and this guy was yeah. big. His brother was the strength coach, and he was big too, and they had just kind of said parted ways, but they wanted to keep what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And he was training these guys like strong <laughs> athletes, a lot of heavy lifts, a lot of, it was, it was good, they were strong. But they a were lot weights, of heavy lifts. But there were weights for the pool. in the water. They were just dead weight in the water. I see what's happening, I'm treating the injuries, I'm starting to going to these practices, I got to watch the tryouts for the team, I'm introduced, this is, this is Dr. Goodman, I'm not a doctor yet, so I'm just feeling awesome, because I'm like, I'm still like eight months away from graduating and becoming a doctor, so I'm just like up here, and at the same time, so this is now the latter part of 2007, I started with the team in December, mm -hmm. in November of 2007, November, maybe December, at the very end of 2007, I started training them. I graduated chiropractic school in April of 2008, so I'm, I'm towards the end. I started interning with Terry at the end of two, or at the yeah. middle of 2006. So we've we have a relationship now. We have a good friendship. He's seen me treat hundreds of people in his clinic at this point, and he trusts me. Yeah. He gets my school to let me do my last like, must have been nine months or eight months of school with him. But. I'm still trying to wrap in where these athletes, you not got yet, that green Not yet, not yet, not <laughs> yet. I haven't gotten it yet. I'm, I'm on his program right now. I'm adjusting them, mm -hmm. I'm doing soft tissue, and I'm doing deadlifts, squats, pull-ups, intervals on the cardio equipment, okay. bicep curls, dumbbell bench presses. I'm, I'm following the program. Shut up, Eric. <laughs> yeah. Follow the program. I'm small, I'm younger than most of the guys on the team, or the same age, on like the average age, and smaller. Mm. So I'm like, I'm minding my business, and I'm doing what I'm told, but I get to be there. And the guys are having really good success with my treatments, mind you. The first thing I did with them was in Chula Vista, the United States Olympic Training Center in, in Chula Vista, California. This is my first time meeting these guys. Yeah. And I'm hands-on, straight up adjusting through some of them really intensely. That gained the trust. They wanted somebody physical. They had never had a trainer that was physical with them. Then I started introducing a little bit of yoga from the first day. But when we do yoga, we do foundation yoga. They don't know that. They're right. just doing what I'm asking them to, but their backs are burning. They're feeling it. They're feeling that low back burn. Let's say I start in November. We train December. We train halfway through January. And that's when I say to Terry, can I 
can I change the program? These guys are heavy. Like, Terry, they're all, well, you didn't train like this. I didn't train like this. Like, these guys are being trained kind of like basketball players. Mm -hmm. like, like they're jumping off of something instead of being buoyant. The changes I made were no weights for quite a while. If you want to do weights, you can do deadlifts and you can do squats. No upper body weights. Other than pull-ups and push-ups. Yeah. The first 30 to 45 minutes of every session was these warm-ups that were nerve flossing, hip hinging mm -hmm. with shoulder movements, wide leg hip hinging with pelvic rotations. Not shoulder tricks, right. nothing like that. Think helicopter style. Yeah, yeah. But hips back was the dominant thing. And then we would lay on our belly and do these squeeze your knees together extension poses. So around January, February, like again, like half the team was into it, half the team wasn't. It was very, it was kind of a rough situation. It was not unifying. It was right. quite the opposite. And it was, it was a problem. Uh, I asked Terry very upfront, can I have another month? He was in for it. He was of the idea that this was much more important for the team than that, than the, the more typical strength mm -hmm. training and conditioning that they were doing. So he was for it, which was very helpful. And then Ryan Brown, the assistant coach, who was really, really into the idea. And he started joining the guys for all the workouts. He was really loving them. Um, it just started to pull that direction. Mm. The, a couple of the older guys, Tony Acevedo in particular, who is the best water polo player in history, in the world. Tony is a five-time Olympian. Um, he and I are about the same age. We're about the same size. I was extremely intimidated by his skill level, but I was not intimidated by him where I was intimidated by some of the other guys on the team, and I didn't like counter with them very much. Whereas Tony, like we talked about a lot, and I really felt, I was very, I really wanted to get his approval of the work because he was the captain of the team, and he was again the best player in the world. When he was, when he pulled to the side of what I was doing, that's when pretty much the entire rest of the team, with a couple stragglers, some of the older guys, uh, just weren't quite there. But that was like, so from January to February was a little nerve wracking, but I, I could feel the shift early on. And I could see the younger guys that were doing it, were, they were like, I feel really good. <laughs> like I feel, I'm feeling really good right now. I don't feel beat up like I normally do. So the older guys started listening. Once a couple of the older guys, Tony in particular, um, Peter Varelis was another one that was really into it. A couple of the goalies, Merrill Moses and Brandon Brooks. When they all got into it, it was easy. Yeah. Then it was like, well, our water polo team, the United States men's national team, does about 85% body weight exercises. In addition to that, we do deadlifts twice a week, squats twice a week. We do pull-ups, push-ups, and these body weight things, these leverage things. And the only cardio that we did outside of the pool was 10 seconds on, 30 to 40 seconds off high intensity training, twice a week, eight to 12 rounds, that's it. Nothing to burn anybody out. Mm -hmm. And then on Fridays, we'd play Ultimate Frisbee. <laughs> and it was kind of fun. Yeah. Um, but every day, we, were, we trained twice a day, three hours in the morning, take a nap during the day, three hours to five hours in the evening. And it was usually two hours to three hours of pool time and then one to two hours of, uh, of training. Every single pool session had a 20 minute warm up prior to it that I led. And then any recovery, so I had 25 Olympians, any recovery, any injuries, sometimes sicknesses, I was the guy. Luckily, I had Terry, who was also a doctor there, but Terry was the head coach. That's what he was there for. He, he wanted me to be what he was capable of without having to do it. Yeah. Um, and from his own words, what he got was a lot more. You know, and I have, if you look through the first book and things, you see these testimonials from Terry Schroeder, from Tony Acevedo about this Silver medal, the United States water polo won at the 2008 Beijing Games. I have it in my room. And it was largely due to a very unique training methodology that made them stronger than they were big and more flexible than they were strong. And it led to them destroying the best teams in the world. It was awesome. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. I mean, that to me is a massive testimony. You've it was. It changed everything. Olympic athletes a... Yeah. Extremely respected doctor, encouraging other people to work with you, be treated yeah. by you, yeah. and fixing your own back yeah. as best you can. I used everything that I taught them is what I was using for myself, except for the deadlifts and the, and the squats. They had no idea they were the guinea pigs. You asked how I got them to be okay with it. I tricked them. 
I tricked them all. I, I acted. All. I acted like I knew so much more than I thought I knew, but it turns out I knew it. Yeah. It was in there. The confidence was accurate, mm. oddly enough, even though at the time it felt faked. Fake it till you make it. But but what I did never shifted. It never changed. I remember how excited I was to tell this guy Ryan Bailey, whose brother was the old strength coach. So he he kind of. Then I started working. Wait, this is after the team, man. The team was successful. They got their medal. Yeah. I moved up to Santa Barbara, and I got a call from a couple of the Lakers. Uh, and Peter Park and I started working with some of the Lakers, Derek Fisher in particular, and I took a real liking to each other. And for the last several years of Derek's career, I got to work with him. And for the 2009, 2010, and 2011 Lakers seasons, I got to work with a number of the Lakers for a couple championships. It was yeah. really cool. Um, but I got to call Ryan Bailey, and I knew he was a huge Lakers fan. And I was like, hey, man, just so you know, I'm training Derek Fisher now. Uh, I know that you had a lot of second guessing of my work over, the year, over that whole time with the team. But I just want you guys to know how thankful I am. Because without you second guessing me, I would never have made this as good as I could get it to. Because yeah. I was so scared. I, told, like, I was so scared of your opinion of me. I was fucking terrified. And just here, it's, I, I felt what happened is I felt the current. When I left the water polo team, I moved to Boulder. I took a couple months to figure things out, realized I needed to be on the West Coast. And as soon as I got to the West Coast, it was like the wheel started spinning of this thing happening that yeah. became foundation training. It's amazing how we, even though we, we really hate them at the time, we need those people to challenge us to, oh, to go yeah. beyond and to be better than we think we can. And you know, yeah. it's, it's one of those biggest ones of, um, of look, being able to look back and go, wow, Thanks to this person doubting me or, mm -hmm. or being a naysayer or really challenging me in ways that made me uncomfortable, I was able to rise and do more. And I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for that. 100%. I mean, it's so important. But from that, you, you now you're, you're writing a book with Peter. Yeah. How, at, at what point after that were you like, I've got something, I'm yeah. going to do a book and, you know, give us a little background on it and, and, the creation. Yeah. I think I told my parents I was going to write a book when I was still with the water polo team. Okay. I think I was like, I'm on to something. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I, I was a chiropractor. At that point, I was a, a doctor of chiropractic, even though I was unlicensed because I hadn't sure. passed my boards. I was a doctor. I'd graduated. I'd fulfilled the requirements to have that title. And I was like, I, re I, think, I'm re I think I'm on to something. I, you know what? I don't think I'm on to something. It's been a couple of years for me, and I'm getting better. I've seen it happen with very high-level athletes, and some of them had worse injuries than me, more acute injuries than me, and it was working for them. I went to Boulder, and I worked with a number of high-level triathletes thanks to another doctor that just out of his own, kind of like, oh, what are you going to do? This is interesting. He handed me his hardest patients. You have any idea how humble that is? That's, that's I've done that rare. to people. We've done, like, it's so rare, but you're like, I want this person to get better. And I had shown him what I was doing, and I had shown him some of the... I had a, a stack of testimonials from the U.S. water polo team. So I had Olympians saying, you got to try what this guy's mm. talking about. And I showed Dr. David Boynton in Boulder, and he said, I have this patient named Brad Seaman, who was a triathlete, and then he got into a car accident, and he does not have the use of the left side of his body anymore. And this guy's in his late 30s, and he really tries to get better, and he's in PT, and he comes in here, and man, we just can't get him better. You want to try? Yeah. And I tried. I didn't charge him. And then I, once he started getting better, I charged him 25 bucks a session. I was so <laughs> excited. He started paying me. Um, but he started getting a lot better. And, and if you look in the first foundation book, you see this testimonial. It's unreal. You, this is what happens. You know this. Um, hang on. This changed this guy's life big. Yeah. And mine too. But this guy, after seven weeks, we trained on the sidewalk in front, of, in front of Dr. Boynton's office. We just trained. We would put his back leg on this park bench and just teach him to use it. And he started running. And he started running and he started biking and he started swimming and it was just like, holy shit, this stuff works. And uh, so that was, the, that was the moment that showed me that I'm doing something like... Yeah, that was, I, when I, I haven't thought about Brad in a long time. Yeah. But if you imagine, you know, you have a 27, 28, 29-year-old chiropractor 
Failing chiropractic school, I thought I was going to be really good at this stuff. My back starts failing, my body starts failing, my career starts failing, my debts are increasing, while at the same time, somehow, this shift starts to occur. I start making myself stronger. I fail my boards at the same time. I make this water polo team better. They get this victorious, remarkable thing. I'm getting worse. My debts are increasing. I fail my boards a second time. I'm in this like this mental, weird, weird headspace. And the emotion that comes out of that is not, it's not, I'm so happy that I helped this person. It's how much they helped me. That process, watching a stroke victim from a traumatic acute stroke gain hemispheric strength in their body is unheard of. And I watched it with my own eyes from something I created. And it blew my mind and it gave me a sense of confidence that is, is intense. Yeah. And it validated everything, like all the waves, every wave I had gone through was validated in that patient. And then in subsequent patients after that now. And over the years, I've had patients, and you've met a lot of them, that were not supposed to get better. And this thing, this, this thing that I started doing for myself, and then this breathing thing that we started to develop, it became something really powerful that started to burst out of me yeah. really intensely. And I couldn't control it. And it was this intense energy and emotion and stress and all these things. And then... I met Peter when I moved to Santa Barbara. Peter and I trained a little bit. I got to train him, which was very new. He had never been trained by anybody. Uh, he had a lot of interesting connections and together we decided he was gonna be the vessel in which I could write a book. That was kind of the agreement with him. It's like, I've got a lot of people that I think could help us get a book out. The book is your information and my Rolodex. That was literally the conversation we had. Your information, my Rolodex. Um, Peter ended up putting a lot of really valuable information yeah. into that book, yeah. and Peter is an incredible, incredible trainer. You know, I believe that. Uh, but it was a really, it was an incredible kind of creative vessel for me to put this idea out there that had, I mean, my God, you're falling off the, the edge of a cliff, and you see this patient that gets better based on your idea, and that's like the strongest grip you can have on that cliff. You're like, okay, I'm not going down that way. I'm going to build something out of this. I'm going to make a career out of this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of debt. I'm going to figure out how to help myself. I'm going to become the person that I planned on becoming. This was all a hiccup. I'm done with that. I'm not looking back anymore. First book comes out and that was, you know, now the trajectory has gone like this. And there's been a lot of different hiccups. Yeah. But the stability has been on an upward trajectory the entire time. And every hiccup has led to more stability. So starting with back pain, then kind of faking it with a team until I really felt confident and they started to feel confident. Then seeing that it wasn't false confidence in the silver medal they won. And they haven't won a medal since and they didn't medal, win a medal for 20 years prior. That was amazing, an amazing moment in time for, for me and that team and for Terry and for, for his team. Um, and then I moved to Boulder and I knew I didn't want to be in Boulder very long, but I got these few patients that really were hard to get better and they got better. Yeah. And then I moved to Santa Barbara and I met this guy who had no reason in the world to listen to me but decided to and then saw the mutual benefit we could get from each other and we wrote this book together and we started working on a ton of patients and clients together. We trained the Lakers together, we trained tons of surfers together, all sorts of different boxers and baseball players and basketball players and all kind of people. He's a legend. He's a legend. I'm going to get him on the road. At some yeah, point. and motocross people and all sorts of stuff. And Peter's incredible. Um, but Peter was the first big vessel for yeah. foundation training, you know. And so you, you do this book. Gosh, my TED Talk with that extension. Yeah. All right, so... You've got a book out with Peter, mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't realize the names that were in there. I look back, I'm like, man, I miss the good days. Matthew McConaughey, Rob Lowe, these really big names giving testimonials in it. And then this element starts to come in that first showed its head during your TED Talk, decompression breathing. Yeah. Can you give a little bit of rationale around it? Because I, I see now before... The only place I'd ever learned ribcage breathing was free diving. Mm -hmm. Everything prior to that was diaphragmatic into the belly. So what was a turning point for you with decompression breathing and give a little breakdown of what you exposed in your TED talk? Okay. 
So yeah, 2010, 2011, we had a, or 2009, 10 and 11 and 12. Peter and I had a really cool run of clientele um, from a lot of the Lakers to, like I said, just like it was, it was a wild time. We had a lot of actors and a lot of actresses and the word got out. Um, and now look, you, you've, you've seen, I've, I've had forward from Chris Hemsworth in the last book. I had forward from Lance Armstrong and we helped him for, um, to, to make a comeback at the Tour de France in 2012. But what's much more important is those things represent people that got out of pain. And, and what's much more important is the reason we have those is just so people understand everybody's normal. Everybody experiences pain. There's really simple ways to get out of it. Uh, that run wasn't continuous. And by the way, like some of those people like Rob Lowe has been Peter's client forever and will remain Peter's client forever. And he loves foundation, but he really loves the intensity of Peter's workouts. Um, Matthew was more of a foundation client. Jeff yeah. Bridges is much more of a foundation client. Um, there's definitely become kind of a delineation. Uh, that said, the reason decompression breathing started to rear its face was if you look at the earliest bits of foundation, there's a tremendous amount of extension at the lower spine and it traveled up the thoracic spine a little bit. And while that was very beneficial to me at the beginning, it started to become a problem mm -hmm. because you don't extend at the thoracic spine. It's a, it's a kyphotic curve. And if you extend at that low thoracic spine, you start to push against a really important area where the psoas stays short, the quadratus lumborum stays short. There's just a lot of muscles. The lats stay short, your chest stays out. It's just not a strong position. It was pain relieving for me for the first couple of years and then it stopped being pain relieving because it became too posterior driven. Decompression breathing, if you really think of it, is just a reposition of the rib cage. You're literally taking the rib cage from in front of you to kind of more balanced behind you. If you think of a bell, very often a person will be kind of leaned and pitched forward yeah. and the front of the bell is open. So then you, then you try to go the other way and the back of the bell is open. And what decompression breathing does is it, it kind of evens out the bell by lifting all sides, by doing that 360 degree expansion you create a voluminous breath. Diaphragmatic breathing doesn't create a voluminous breath. It creates a rigid torso that you're breathing into, which is important for a lot of resistance stuff, but it is not important for posture. Posture is a lifting process. Posture is an upward expansion process. It's like a plumb line is not rest and see where it falls. It's lift and see where you can pull it. What decompression breathing does is it provides lift from the center instead of lift from the top. Okay. Lift from the center is expansive from the center out, down, up, everywhere. But it's taking into account the lungs are only here. There's no lungs in the abdomen. There's no lungs in the belly. There's no, like, that's not where the lungs are. So what my stupid brain just says, well, if my lungs are here, that's the only place I really want to fill air into. And I want to make that tissue really, really good at exchanging air in and out. Yeah. And it was crazy how rigid my lungs felt, you know, like I could always, I always had a pretty good, I always had a pretty good lung volume from swimming, but I never realized that I just was really good at breathing into the front of my chest. You know, in water polo, you literally swim with your chest mm -hmm. up. So you get really expansive at the front. It's easy. That's why everybody's shoulders are back. It's really hard to breathe into the back of my ribs. And if I feel weak at something, I'm like, ah, it drives me nuts. I got to fix this. This is like, it's going to drive me insane. Especially once I started fixing my lower back. Once I felt the sensation of strength that was like freedom giving, like I have pain, I have less pain because of this strength. All I wanted to do was find the other places in my body that needed that. And it wasn't like, okay, well I have to learn to use my serratus anterior and my serratus posterior and I have to use my SCM muscles. Yeah. What I tried to do was fill my rib cage. And as I filled it, I realized these accessory muscles that started working as you couple that with the internal rotations that you do that we do and then you pull that into a hip hinge just taking a big breath into the rib cage in a hip hinge challenges the back of the body more if you keep the abdomen tensioned if you keep the lats fired if you keep the base of the skull that very important external occipital protuberance pulling up it's almost like you can't not breathe into the whole rib cage. Right. It's like this pulley system that just, you start to really feel it. And I just, I got lost in that sensation. You know, look, I, one of my favorite things about foundation training is that 
to get to my understanding of foundation training, I smoked a lot of pot, I ingested a lot of pot, I did a lot of inner developmental feeling. You'll and read about it soon. You'll read about it very soon. Um, but I did, you know, that was a really big part of my process was, ow, I hurt. <sighs> That's a little better. You know, then I would lay down and feel, okay, what am I feeling? Mm. Okay, I've got years and years and years of biomechanical knowledge, anatomy knowledge, physiology knowledge, and injury experience now. I got experience now. I want to feel it and I want to understand it. And the beauty of cannabis is it, it delivers that peacefully. You can explore without really hurting yourself if you're not too terribly injured, which I wasn't and I'm not. I'm just degenerated. They're, they're very different. Imagine 2011, 2000, so I, my book came out in May 2011. I can envision laying on the floor as the book is out, as I'm working on the exercises in the book, I'm working on like supine decompression, what became supine decompression. Mm -hmm. We already had the knees squeezing. That's been a part of this for a long time. We already had the internal rotation. But all of a sudden we started, instead of extending to be tugging against the hips and the pelvis, I started expanding. Mm -hmm. And that provided such a better tug of war. It provided this uniform tug of war. So imagine you just took a couple tokes of sour diesel and you're somebody like me that has this heightened sensitivity that I've been working on for years and years and years now of trying to like, what am I feeling? How am I doing this? And I'm just laying on the floor and I'm lengthening my neck. And I'm, wow, that really, God, if I lift my head up a quarter inch, I feel that whole SCM. And you've seen me treat a bunch of people yeah. having him lift the head a quarter inch and get those things firing. And just imagine feeling that, connecting it with kind of the dots you've already been feeling. And then just being willing to try it on people, kind of. Yeah. And that's decompression breathing, was the willingness to try it on myself, feel what I felt, understand it to the best of my ability, and then try it on other people, ask them what they felt, have them kind of explain what they were feeling to me, and just keep playing with it. And I had these patients at that time that really trusted me. And I really trusted me. So, I went Now, for would you... Would you say that's when the idea of a different kind of strong was born? <laughs> was that early in the book? No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But I've seen that a timeline different, for a long time. A different kind of strong was well before the book. A different yeah. kind of strong was my tagline for my first ever foundation classes. Before it was foundation, it was called Foundation Roots. Yeah. And I had these little, I had these 10 class punch cards that I sold for $80 a piece. And my first class participant, Robert Kemp in Santa Barbara, framed his punch card and kept it after his eight punches. And that made me feel really special because he felt special. He thought I was onto something too. No book yet, just like the community came around yeah. quickly. And you've seen how the classes build up. Now imagine like it's your first time doing this and the first class you teach is five people, the second class is 10 people, the fourth class is 30 people, the fifth class is 60 people. You're like, Some, I'm onto something here. Yeah. And that was where the back of that card said, find a different kind of strong. Nice. That's pretty <laughs> awesome. So I've got this plan, and, and, and really it's from this community. Mm -hmm. And this plan that this has all stemmed from is the, when I started to go down this journey of learning from you, um, reconnecting after my knee injury, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I had already had the background in strength and conditioning and performance training in the fire service. I was working with all the recruits. Chris DeMag mm -hmm. had kind of been that guy to empower me to mm -hmm. play and help coach and, and use my education on strength and performance, had a knee injury, start training with you, and right away it was like, yeah, this is, this is not anything I've ever known. This is crazy. Oh, I can come to the course, great, I'm gonna come learn. And being mind blown of what stood out to me as I started asking you, can I come again? Can I come again? Can I come again? And mm -hmm. every single certification I would show up and attend because the information was so much and the workouts were so intense in a different way I couldn't explain. But the most compelling part I'm getting to is people standing up at the cert. And I've never seen this at a course. I've been to a lot of courses at this point. Sharing their stories of these debilitating injuries, these mm -hmm. years of being robbed. 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 And you're robbed. People don't understand that. When you're your life is over when all you can think of is the pain you're in. 
your relationships, your friendships, your work life, your, li your relationship with your kids, your relationship with yourself. People are like, oh, your back hurts. No, you're on the floor yeah. and you're looking at the world happen around you as if you're in a wheelchair as it, and it sucks and it drives people to a point of absolute madness and suicide. And I appreciate you talking because yeah. that starts to You feel it, up. right? It's, it's, like, it's legit. It, it, but to hear those stories, that's what really made me go, wow. Mm -hmm. All those times I tried to get Eric to come out and party, he's like, no, nah, I'm going to study. I knew he was working <laughs> on something. I knew there was something bigger than this. And to hear these people, person after person, sharing their stories and why they're there to help other people. Yeah. That is the most powerful thing I've ever been a part of. Um, and now I'm a part of foundation training. And when I, we get to play with it because we've taught it to everybody. Now you've been, you came through the 12th or 13th certification and now we have taught We'll, we'll do our 50th in October. It's crazy. So you've been through, and these, I mean, you've experienced, this isn't like a sales thing for no, the cert, but no. we watch as people go from a version of themselves they were really pissed off about and kind of miserable with, and then to a version of themselves that they're super proud of. Yeah. And they're, they've done this transformation themselves physically, pulled themselves out of really shitty weak spots into the feeling of, of power. And the stories in there are kind of accidental, but... I don't know. I, if, you, if somebody would have tried to tell me how powerful this process would have been for people, much more than it has been for me. It's yeah. been powerful for me in a lot of cool ways. It's been powerful for you. It's given you a totally different type of career, Great. right? It's changed your whole life, changed my whole life. Like A journey of, uh, it's, it's the, the journey to learn. Like, you open up, a, what I'd say you did, Eric, for me and many other people, is open up a new door of what's possible mm -hmm. and a curiosity to go down that road and explore it. But it it's not an overnight cure. Take the and blue pill, take the red take, pill. Yeah, <laughs> and enough, it, hearing those stories compelled me enough to go, I'm, after mm -hmm. many long discussions yeah. and traveling with you and, you know, went from attending certifications to traveling with you and being an assistant and then hovering around you and picking your brain. And that's years, by the way. Like yeah. for anybody, that's years. This was 2014, 15, 16. 2017, right before Sonny was born, is when you were really full on, and mm. you were then the drive, one of the driving forces with me and Dustin of changing the entire team. And that was when we kind of took over everything. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's just the, the stories, it compelled me to go into this new career and walk mm -hmm. away from one that I never thought I'd leave. But that's really where I was going with all this long fighting back emotions. Thank mm -hmm. you for helping me through that. But We've got so many compelling stories in the community and that's what my hope is with this vlog mm -hmm. and this travel is to start to share some of those and bring them to light, especially while we're going through this time of a pandemic. You know, and so is there anything that you can add for people out there regarding the value in hearing what other people have to share and the people that get to learn from in this? You know, if we were if we were as good at marketing <laughs> as we are at teaching people the significant ability they can find within themselves and seeing that happen and perpetuate time and time and time and time again and then seeing the ripple effect that that has in families and communities versus the negative impact that comes from the typical pathway of chronic problem relief and autoimmune relief that people go through and the breakdown that that causes in their their families and their communities it is something that i i live and die on that hill that's my hill that's your hill the reason you did this, the reason you're a firefighter is you love helping people. The reason, I, I see it in every single thing you do from when we were young to where we are now. You like to help people feel happy and well and good. And that's, Court yeah, but that's good. That's wonderful. And what we do in foundation training is we help people recognize that the hormones, the, the things you feel like you're lacking, the strength, the skills, most of them are actually there. You just have to find them. Most of the things you think you have to be almost like searching for somebody else to do for you, it's kind of there for you. And you can do it if you take a little time. And a lot of people have never truly put time into themselves. They've just kind of gone the, the path in life that they thought they were meant to. The feeling of successfully trying, of trying to help yourself and then successfully doing it is like one of the best hormone releases in the human existence, yeah. you know? And so, how would you say now you've evolved and changed and what can people expect from this next book? I got, I'm not, it's not that I wasn't honest 
in the first books. I was very honest. I just wasn't forthcoming about how I came up with this work. I was forthcoming about my injuries. I was forthcoming about the strengths that needed to be had. But I was not honest about my primary pain relief mechanism of choice being cannabis. To the point where for over 15 years now, I have been what I would call deeply researching <laughs> the power, complexity, and capacity of that plant. And my initial observation is that it is extraordinary at helping people get out of major, major chronic pain patterns, physical, mental, PTSD, PTSI, as I really prefer it called, posterior mm -hmm. traumatic stress injury, because it's like a bruise in the brain. It's not a degeneration. It's not a disorder. Uh, cannabis is just this idea of, of, of medicine that, that is lost and beautiful. And it's very side effect free. And the worst thing that might happen is you might think you're going to die, but you're not going to die. You're going to be fine. It's a really important thing. And I've actually decided that that's kind of part of my hill. Um, you know, if I'm standing over here saying you can take care of yourself with posture and breath and eating well and, and doing all these things, you can do better, but really specific movements especially can get you better. What I also want to tell people is why. Yeah. And the why is the endogenous cannabinoid system. And I feel so lucky to have enjoyed the plant that the system is named after. But the endogenous cannabinoid system is at play every single time you take a medicine, every single time you feel a stressor, every single time you have a hormone secretion, every single time you're breathing, you and every other vertebrate in the world, vertebrate, mammal in the world has this homeostasis dispatch system. Mm -hmm. The term now used for it is the endogenous cannabinoid system. The book that I'm writing correlates foundation training postures and a few others. The sympathetic nervous system, our flight and fight response nervous system that is housed primarily in the back edges of the thoracic rib cage column, and heat, sauna, purging, purging the lymphatic system, purging the sweat system, but more creating a natural high degree stressor on a very mm. frequent basis that challenges your physiology and then you have to come down from it. And it's basically the physical guide to stress management and adaptation using posture, breath, and heat, and using that to get out of major symptoms. I don't care if your neck hurts a little. I want to know the people whose life is altered by pain and symptoms who want to get better. That's who this is for. I think it's a, a, a powerful one for firefighters as well yeah. in the detox category. And we're going to talk on this and get down to my firehouse in Florida, but yeah. the detox pathways as well as those stress management because We've talked about it many times when I left back careers. We don't realize we're living in this constant high stress after playing in that world nonstop as a fireman. Oh, you guys are stress, so strong. Oh, and I'm gonna medicate yeah. with coffee all the time. Yeah. That's a, that, we can say that for another day. Um, okay, outside of foundation training, I wanna finish up with a couple of questions yeah. for you. Sure. What other tools? So, what other tools outside of foundation training? do you use now to, to stay healthy, to stay active, mm -hmm. especially through the pandemic? You can see them all in that little clinic room. I have my sauna, and I use traditional sauna. I'm not a big, I'm not a, I think the infrared is fine, but I'm a really big fan of traditional mm -hmm. hot sauna. Give me 190, 200 degrees, 20, 30 minutes, and just melt away the blues or whatever, yeah. the pains, whatever, I, I love it. I do a sauna pretty much every day. I swing a kettlebell, but I, I lift, I press. I, I have a 70 pound kettlebell and a 40 pound kettlebell. And I just do kind of every different movement I can with that. Um, I like laying on the ground in like a supine decompression or an anchored bridge and using the heavier kettlebell for lat mm -hmm. pullovers. I think that's one of the best tools for that. And then, so for anybody watching, for from 2006 to 2000, about 16, I was off weights. I did not use weights. I was very, I was really like, ah, those really hurt me. They, they used to hurt my back a lot when I would use them. And then when you came into the picture again and started, first it was all foundation training stuff, but then we start, you started to show me almost like how the principles started to align with a lot of the strength work you were doing. You started to help me understand the value in the additional strength training, plain and simple. And a lot of people had tried over the years, but I just didn't quite vibe with their take on it or why they did it. You helped me understand it. 
And we started strength training. I started deadlifting with you again. We started kettlebells. Well, I think it helped. You came. You, you did come to the firehouse too quite a bit when I was still on, on That's the right. job. Yeah. And so we were able to play and kind of myself and right. the firefighters show you how we were joining in the gym, yeah. doing foundation training, and then bringing it principles into the strength training and we were having yeah. like I would say I brought it back to our lab yeah. and started playing around a little bit and went oh man this makes my squat better oh the 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 bar on my back I don't feel so much compression mm -hmm. anymore oh using this after using it before mm -hmm. zipping back up like the, all these things started to come together one of the biggest correlations I think you made for me was the low bar back squat and the difference in that mechanism of hip drive with a weight and what I had been always kind of teaching with founders is hip drive, hip drive, hip drive, not hip thrust forward, but hip drive backward. Mm. And it's funny as I'm thinking about the Orlando fire department, the Orlando fire station. Now I'm thinking about the certification we did in satellite beach. And then we went, maybe it was right before, I think it was before the certification when we did the first event for Orlando. Yeah, it was. It was. It was, it was like a yeah. year or two before, right? Yep. And that was when I met Chris. Yeah. We went out, I remember that. And we went out to lunch and stuff. Okay. So you guys had a real, you have a really nice facility. Orlando, downtown Orlando has a really nice gym, really nice facility. I think the first time I started to trust kettlebells was we were staying, we were in the rig. Say Rancho Oso? I think Rancho Oso. It might have been in Florida one of the trips we were in the rig down there, but you brought your kettlebells over. I brought them everywhere. Yeah, and I just started, and you were like, no, I was swinging. I'm like, I was nervous. I was nervous. Yeah. Um, but as it turned out, I did fine, and then I started. I started to, for like a year, I would play with weights, play with kettlebells, like lift. I would never go over like, never heavy, yeah. never been close to heavy. Um, but now I, I trust myself to go heavy. I can do anything now. I feel like now I'm five years into weight training again. All of a sudden, I'm five years into weight training. You well, know, there's a, definite, I, there's a shift I saw with you where just like, oh, Eric looks bigger. Yeah. All you were doing is swinging the kettlebell. I get big playing. fast. <laughs> well, in, in you know, with the hip drive comment, I want to yeah. throw a shout out if they ever pay attention to this, but. The, the Mark Ripito yeah. coach of starting strength because yeah. that's that is their it's so like important the most powerful book I believe in strength and conditioning um, starting strength but mm -hmm. that and then Pavel Satsulin on the kettlebell and mm -hmm. you know the the only times I've ever ran into trouble with a kettlebell is letting people that really didn't have an extensive background with kettlebells influence my swing because they wanted it to look like what they believed was the way because they knew body movement yeah they didn't know bringing in this. So I always go, I always throw that out when we talk about strength training is make sure you're learning from the right people, not just people that might know one system. You can't do, yeah. The, I'm not the right person to teach you kettlebells. Now I can, cause I've been doing them for several years, but even then I'm going to say, yeah, he should teach you kettlebells cause he's learned starting strength. I, I believe in the starting strength principles for, or I'm sorry, in the, in the, in the strong first principles for kettlebells. Everything I've read from Pavel is just like, well, yeah, obviously, you know, yeah, it makes sense. Legend. Yeah. And then strength is not complex. That was one of the most important things I think I had to kind of learn over the whole foundation training process and then into the combination of, of strength training with it. It's just the easier, most fundamental movements, easier meaning like big complex hip movement versus like twisting rotation of a mm -hmm. bicep compartmentalized motion. You know, like the, the joint doing what it's supposed to do is fundamentally better than any of the tricky stuff out there. Locking your, I, I always say of my biggest cautions that I got myself over the summer was locking yourself into a unit and letting your body have to navigate around what the machine will allow you to do as yeah. opposed to external force that you navigate. And that's mm -hmm. what, you know, my new one, thanks to Josh Holland, is the, is the blood flow restriction bands mm -hmm. and that being such a great adjunct. But that's another rabbit hole of, of discussion. Influences for you, Eric, mm -hmm. who, who, or your modern day people that are inspiring you and inspiring your path on growth? I would say if you asked me that question like five years ago, it would have been Tim Brown. It would have been Peter. It would have been, honestly, Dustin's done a lot. Dustin and I have had some really interesting conversations over the years. And I don't, I mean, I have mentors and I have people I look to that I've never met. But I mean people I know, like yeah. I think of people I know. Um, but over the past like, over the past handful, over the past decade, I've been able to really meet some interesting people. And like you said, like I, I built my own Rolodex. And out of that Rolodex, I've met a few people that are like extraordinary at what they do. 
From the strength training and strength component, there's no question. Like, you're the biggest influence in there for the past five years. There's no question. That has changed my perception of, of this work, and it's changed the way I teach the work. From a creativity component, um, so I have this patient that I've stayed in touch with over the years. He's one of my first patients, the guitarist, Buckethead. And I have these really interesting conversations with, with Bucket on a very regular basis. Sometimes we jam together. I don't play guitar like he does, but I play guitar. Um, and I've just watched this guy who I've known since he was about 40, 41, and now he's 52, 53. Um, and I've been able to help him, and he's been able to really help me with the process of staying very creative and just not caring why you're doing it. Yeah. Just the process of being creative for the, for the fun of it. Just because it's awesome to come up with new stuff and new angles and new ideas and new rationales and all these things. So Bucket's actually been quite an inspiring person to me. Um, you know, when I, when I saw Jen raising Sunny, there was a lot of elements of it that were almost frustrating to me, the degree of detail and OCD mm. that she went with it. But over the years, uh, I've come to respect that level of focus to a, and concentration to a point that it changed the way that I look at our business and our work. And I, and I try to kind of hit that similar level. Um, so inspiration has really changed. When I, was, when I was kind of in this delusion of grandiosity of this changing the world and me, you know, like in the first few years, I looked at people that I'll never meet in my life as my influences. But now when I think of an influence, I'm like, who do I want to kind of impress with what I'm doing? You know, yeah. who do I want to look back at this and be like, wow, I'm really, that's really, that's really cool. Really cool that you did that. Like really, really stoked to know you and to be a part of this. Then I just think of the team. I think of the family. I, I have surrounded myself with the people that inspire me the most in my life. I think that's what you're supposed to do if you get the chance to. Yeah. I'm surrounded by them, you know? Some of them piss me off <laughs> and I piss them off. But I am genuinely surrounded by people that I feel are gifted at what they do, creative as anything, intelligent, useful, and if shit goes down to it, I can depend on them, yeah. regardless of the... If we have to get out of something, we're going to get out of something. If we have to help somebody, we're going to help somebody. Like, I have a really capable community around me, which, yeah, that's it. That's my inspiration now. Right on. Yeah.